If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalms 93. Psalms 93. Pretty close to, uh, well, not quite center, but we're, we're getting there. Psalm 93. I'll be reading from the King James Version. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world is also established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up. O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. Yea, than the mighty waters of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. May the Lord place a blessing on the reading of his word. Thank you, Brother Roger, for leading us in our scripture reading. Before we dig into our study for today, I just want to somehow convey how excited and thankful I am for such an awesome church family. Everyone I've talked to has been so welcoming, so thoughtful, so warm, and I just want to thank you for adopting me into this family and uh, the blessing of getting to praise and serve our wonderful God together. Thank you for all that you do for King Jesus. I was not in here when the announcements were shared but was there a report given on what God did Sunday right here in our church? A, a small report. Praise God. That was so exciting. To, now, I suspect that one story that might not have been told happened right at the beginning of the clothing giveaway. On the way over, I, I got the idea I wanted to hang out a little bit here. And so on the way driving over here, I got a phone call from a uh, from a, a lady that uh, was in one of the first churches that I ever had the privilege of pastoring and she said I want you to call me grandma and uh, over the course of time she has a great grandson that uh, was in a, a terrible accident with a firearm that uh, uh, left him with some severe head injury he has made a remarkable, remarkable recovery. Uh, and it took that tragedy to open up his heart to Jesus. And he's ended up getting baptized in the nursing home where he lives. And his goal is, by God's grace, one of these days to walk out of there. And now, but until he does, his mission in life, as he studied the Bible and learned things, he makes no secret about it. He wants to make everybody in that uh, in that care center fall in love with Jesus. And so he is a missionary, turn it, doing uh, what he can to lead everybody to Jesus. And I just praise the Lord for that. But uh, I got a phone call on the way over here Sunday that said uh, the next day was his birthday. And it dawned on me, I need something to stick in the mail to him. And when I walked in, I, I was sharing this story with the team that was working, and they said, we've got the perfect thing. There was a, a, a I'm not sure the right word, for I'm going to call it a pillow, that looked like an elephant. And this guy loves critters. And so it was just the perfect match. And so uh, the, the amazing, uh, the reason I'm telling the story is so good, uh, neat how God works, not only to supply that piece of, uh, uh, of blessing, but to spread the work that has been done here in this church even beyond the borders of Harrison. Thank you for helping to make his birthday special. This morning, there's lots of things we could praise the Lord about, but we're here to study His Word. And before we read some more from it, would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, thank you that you have given us a letter from you 
that contains the messages for your people in these last days. And Lord, my words, they fall short. They have no power. But you do. Somehow, could you please hide me behind the cross? Could you please breathe life into your words and make them speak to our hearts today? In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to the little New Testament book of Titus. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, we read a verse that should be near and dear to the heart of every one of us. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. The Bible says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. How many of you are looking forward to that blessed hope when Jesus comes in the clouds to rescue us from this planet earth and take us to our permanent home in heaven? I read a verse like that and I get excited because I'm longing for that day to come. I can't wait to see Jesus come. But brothers and sisters, that is not a day to look forward to if we're not ready. And the reason I like this verse is because in a world that has gone crazy and chaotic and full of all kinds of problems, God's Word gives us hope that we can count on. And brothers and sisters, we are surrounded by all kinds of people looking for hope. You might be one of those looking for something to look forward to, something to give you strength and courage. And brothers and sisters, God's Word is full of that message. And so, in in Titus 2.13, in fact, if we read some of the verses above and, and, and to follow it, listen to what God is saying through the Apostle Paul. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to a few of us. What does it say? To all! Brothers and sisters, there is an invitation that we need to start with every time we open God's Word, and that is to come to the foot of the cross and recognize how much God loves you. And I heard one amen. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you? He sent all of heaven when He sends His Son to die on the cross because there is no greater love than the love God has for you. And we see that throughout Scripture. But there is something more than simply knowing that He loves us. Because in 2 in Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, we read these words. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. The Bible says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Something happens when you and I come to the foot of the cross and study the love of Jesus. Something happens that changes our lives. We cannot be the same as we gaze into the love of Jesus. In fact, there's a statement that I ran across, and uh, it comes from the book Christ Object Lessons, and it says Christ's favorite theme. If we're interested in studying Christ, copying Christ, and, uh, and living, uh, living the way He has designed, I'm interested 
in what his favorite theme is. Christ's favorite theme was the paternal tenderness and abundant grace of God. Sometimes we talk about what's your favorite place to go on vacation? What's your favorite food? Here we're asking, what was Christ's favorite theme to talk about? And I love this answer, the paternal tenderness and abundant grace of God. Keeps going, he dwelt much upon the holiness of his character and his law. He presented himself to the people as the way, the truth, and the life. And then, here's the reason this statement has stuck with me. Let these be the themes of Christ's ministers. In other words... When I stop and say, Lord, what do you want me to talk about on Sabbath morning? Heads up. Let these be the themes of Christ's ministers. Number one, present the truth as it is in Jesus. Number two, make plain the requirements of the law and the gospel. Number three, tell the people of Christ's life of self-denial and sacrifice, of his humiliation and death, of his resurrection and ascension, of his intercession for them in the courts of God, of his promise, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Are those some good topics to talk about as we gather here as a church family on Sabbath morning, realize the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross, realizing the nearness of his soon return, and realizing the purpose that he has for us in our community, in our homes, in our schools, in our work. To share that good news. Um, But I ran across a different statement this week. Some of you probably saw it too. It was yesterday's devotional reading in the the book Amazing Grace. And it piggybacks on the song that uh, we just experimented with. Uh, For some reason I've been fascinated by that word. Because it says simply the Lord Jesus is making experiments on human hearts. Uh, Now let's process that for a moment. Anybody here ever done an experiment? Maybe it was in the kitchen, maybe it was in the yard, maybe it was uh, building something. We've all done different kinds of experiments. They don't all have to be in a science lab. They could, uh, they could be in a machine shop or they can be in a classroom. It can be all kinds of different experiments. But Jesus is making experiments on our hearts. Wow. Through the exhibition of his mercy and abundant grace, he is affecting transformations so amazing that Satan, with all of his boasting, with all his confederacy of evil united against God and the laws of his government, stands viewing them as a fortress impregnable. They are to him an incomprehensible mystery. Wow, that's exciting. Because I suspect that most of us have been attacked in some way by the enemy this week. Maybe he's attacked you over time this week. And yet, as I read that, and for all of the enemy's boasting and and, and triumphant claims, he is no match for God. And when he sees God working in my life, when he sees God working in your life, not only can he not believe what the power of God can do, but he views it as an impregnable fortress. 
But check this out. Let's go on a journey in Scripture. These these quotes in Scripture set the stage for a passage of Scripture that I I pray speaks to our heart today. In the book of Jeremiah, notice with me, Jeremiah chapter 18. Uh, For now, we'll just start with verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1. The Bible says, The Word... Jeremiah 18 and verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Please make no mistake about it. Our power as Christians comes from the Word of God. Travel with me in in your minds back to when Jesus is out in the wilderness being tempted of Satan. How did He answer the enemy? It is written. In fact, if we hold our finger here, let's just take a quick detour to a couple of verses in the New Testament. In in Hebrews chapter 4, And notice with me verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Bible says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There is power in God's Word. And that's why as we study it together, not just on Sabbath morning, but every day throughout the week, every encounter that we spend in the Word of God transforms us to be like Jesus. But let's travel over to, I want to say, 1 Timothy. Notice with me 1 Timothy chapter 4. I said first, I actually should have said second, Second Timothy chapter 4. And notice the counsel that Paul is giving to young Timothy. In fact, I can't resist backing up. We're going to start in Second Timothy chapter 3. And notice verse 15. Second Timothy 3 and verse 15, the Bible says that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee, what? Wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And then it continues, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine brothers and sisters is that being fulfilled today All around us, we see all different kinds of winds of doctrine blowing, and our only safety is to be anchored in the Word of the living God. And so the Word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 18, the Word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord said, Arise any time God's Word comes to us. It lifts us up. God is calling us to a higher, stronger experience with Him that only comes through the power of His Word. It also doesn't let us stay where we are. The Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, said, Arise and go. 
In this case, he was to go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Uh, been a couple of years ago now, maybe even longer, had the opportunity to go on a mission trip over to Romania. And uh, it, it was an incredible experience. It was still winter time, and there was lots of snow on the ground. And uh, if you haven't figured out by now, I, I, I love snow. And uh, so that was quite a treat. And here, uh, the first week, I, I had the privilege of spending at one church, and the second week was at a different church. And, and uh, so I was at the second church, and uh, there were people night by night coming to hear God's Word, and the uh, pastor was translating. And one night after the meeting, a gentleman came up to me and said, I wish you'd come visit me where I work. I said, all right, what, where do you work? I'd love to. He said, uh, the community that you're at is one of the few places on planet Earth that has naturally black clay. We don't have to paint it or dye it. It comes straight out of the ground that way, and we're world-renowned for the pottery that we, uh, we produce. And I wish you'd come, and uh, uh, I work in, uh, in a shop, and I make uh, different things out of clay. Come check it out. And so uh, a few days later, I, I, I had the privilege, the pastor dropped me by and uh, went in to see him at work. And uh, sure enough, he had an electric wheel that just went around and around and around. I don't think the potter back in Jeremiah's day had that electric wheel. It was, uh, uh, but at any rate, this, uh, this uh, gentleman, he uh, said, I am uh, new to the Adventist faith. I'm enjoying coming to the meetings. I uh, 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 am. I'm learning some things that I should be keeping the Sabbath and uh, what happens uh, uh, in the future when Jesus comes again. It's all new to me because uh, I'm a, a member of another faith community in town. Uh, at any rate, as he's talking about all these things, he's also busy with his hands. And it was amazing to me as he's working with his hands, he takes this blob of clay, set it on his wheel, and in just a matter of seconds, had this intricate-looking vase. And it was finished, basically, ready to go off and be baked. And I looked at that, I said, how did you do that so quickly? He said, well, I've only made a few thousand of them, uh, um, but it's not hard. Why don't you try it? I said, really? You, you, you'd let me try it, okay? So, uh, so he got up and uh, let me sit in his chair and uh, put a new lump of clay there. And I started holding my fingers the way I thought he had held them. And the most obnoxious uh, blob begins to emerge that uh, I, I, I'm looking at him and I say, you made it look so easy. How come mine is a disaster? He said, well, it can be fixed. He said, let's trade back. So he, he sits back down, and uh, uh, he, he didn't make a vase this time. I think he made a plate, but he took that mixed up, messed up blob of clay that I turned into a disaster, and he made it into a beautiful work of art that he could then sell. And I thought, wait a minute, that's exactly what happened here in Jeremiah. Because in chapter uh, 18, verse 4, it says, The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. And then the punchline comes, and brothers and sisters, please don't miss the message that God was trying to send to Jeremiah. And I believe that it's a message that was not only relevant to Jeremiah and to Israel of old, but it's a message that I need to hear, and I pray that you need to hear today. Because in verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord, 
Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Brothers and sisters, God has an amazing plan for every single one of his children. Make no mistake about it. God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And God is able to work and mold and transform you into a vessel of honor and glory to His name. That's the miracle of the gospel. I was traveling one day. And if I use the word coincidence, can you translate that appropriately, please? Because I don't believe in coincidence. I do believe in divine appointments. Amen? I'm traveling home from church one day. I'm headed home, and I make a wrong turn. Now, now, how do you make a wrong turn going home? I've only lived there for maybe five or ten years, so I know the way home. But coincidentally, I make a wrong turn. Please translate that word appropriately because I get a phone call as I'm driving. And, and the, the phone call was like, I, I, I wish you would stop by and see this sick person in the hospital. And thanks to that wrong turn, the moment I'm getting that phone call, I'm going in front of that very hospital. So talk about divine appointments. Anyhow, it was a friend from church whose brother was sick, and they asked if I would stop in there. And when I walked in, I was not prepared for what was about to happen. Because he looked at me in the face and said, uh, my brother sent you, didn't he? I said, as a matter of fact, yes. He said, well, pastor, I am not going to beat around the bush. I'm going to level with you. I'm in my 40s. I have a felon record. I am have no job, no family, no car, no driver's license. I am a massive failure and said I just feel like giving up but my brother keeps saying you ought to give God a try and he said pastor to be honest I don't even know if I believe that God exists and it was one of those moments where I'm immediately trying to think in my mind how Do I prove from Scripture that God exists? And as my mind is racing and I'm thinking, what do I say? This was not the question I was expecting, but I found something coming out of my mouth that I wasn't expecting to say. I said, it hasn't exactly worked well for you what you have tried. So what have you got to lose? Rather than try to prove to you that God exists, what have you got to lose? Give him a try. And he looked at me like, you know what? That's a good point. It's amazing how God can come up with things to say and put words in our mouth when we least expect it. And maybe you've had that experience. And, 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 uh, and so he said, you know what? The, I, I, if, if I'm discharged from this hospital, I... I'm going to do that. Now, now the back story was that, uh, unfortunately, he had gotten into some bad drugs and had done some bizarre things. There had been a police chase, and uh, uh, he had not remembered to put clothes on, and so you get the picture of them stuffing him in the back of a patrol car, and uh, they're whisking him away to jail, and the sheriff that's driving him was a Christian and told him about the gospel on the whole way to jail. Of course, then at jail, uh, things, uh, he had some medical complications and uh, ended up unresponsive and rushed to the hospital. And the doctors told his family, said he will probably not wake up. 
But if he does, he'll be a vegetable the rest of his life. And here we are in the hospital room conversing together. So there's already some amazing miracles that are happening. And if I use the word coincidence again, please translate it appropriately because as he's discharged, our church is beginning evangelistic meetings. And so he calls up and says, I would come if somebody would give me a ride. And so he got a ride. He sat in the very back of the church. And he began to listen to the evangelist talk about the blood of Jesus that can wash away every sin, every stain. And one evening after the meeting, he, he came to me and said, we need to talk for a second. Um, why don't we go... The only thing open at that time happened to be Pizza Hut. And he said, let's go get a salad. We're sitting there talking over a salad. And he looks at me and says, every time, the evangelist talks about Jesus on the cross. My heart begins to thump. What's going on? Holy Spirit. He's fallen in love. He's fallen in love with Jesus. And right there in that restaurant, he prayed to ask Jesus in his heart. Just days before, couldn't believe that God even existed. But now, he's being captivated by the Word of God. And God is taking a mixed up mess and is beginning to fashion something that will be a trophy of his grace. A few days later, got a call from him and he said, I really need some help. I need a ride to court. And I'm petrified. Would you just sit in the audience and pray? I just need to see a face with somebody praying. And he had already heard the guy arrested the same time he was got an extra 15 years. And um, that, that morning I'm sitting there in the courtroom and um, uh, the judge is in a very bad mood. <laughs> in fact, he threw the first two cases out. Didn't even want to, them to continue. He was upset. And this guy's attorney looks at me and says, I know we told you you wouldn't have to say anything. But when they swear in the relevant parties, we need you to be sworn in in case you have to testify. I said, wait a minute. I wasn't expecting this. I was to be a silent prayer partner sitting silently, quietly in the courtroom. They said, we don't know how this is going to go. We, we got to cover our bases. And so uh, here, here we were. The, is it the bailiff or who reads the charges? Uh, at any rate, the, the person that reads the charges began to go and go. And the judge put his hand up and said, stop. I'm very familiar with this case. And then he looked over in my direction he said, I've also heard that this guy has started going to church and he's giving God a chance to change his life. He said, are you the pastor? I said, yes, sir. I, I mean, yes, your honor. He said, stand up. I want to talk to you. And I'm not picking on Brandon, but since he's close, I can point at him like the judge pointed at me. And it was the same reaction because I wasn't expecting this. And, uh, and the judge says, if I could, I would sentence every person that comes into my drug court to go to church. But they don't give me that privilege. He said, Pastor, the only thing that will change people is the Word of God and the love of a church family. 
And as long as you surround him, as long as your church surrounds him with the love and the compassion and the support that he needs, and as long as he keeps looking to God for answers, he will be fine. He said, but if he lets go, I promise you, he's going to be right back in front of me again. And I'm going to throw the book at him then. Case dismissed. His eyes got that big. He was shocked. That was the last thing he expected. But brothers and sisters, we have a God who specializes in doing the impossible. And I don't know what messes you have found yourself in. There are messes that take place even in the lives of church people. And brothers and sisters, even if God has transformed you into a trophy of grace, you are surrounded by people who need that transforming power in their own lives. And Jeremiah reminds us that God longs to do in us and God longs to do in others such a miracle of transformation that all heaven gets excited. My question today is, are we willing to let the potter mold us and make us into what he designed? In fact, if you have your Bibles, travel with me just a few pages over to the the book of Isaiah. And notice with me chapter 64. In in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8, the Bible says, But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay, and Thou our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. Today, is it your desire to have the master potter continue to fashion you into a trophy of honor and glory to his name? Are you willing to let the potter do that? More than that, are you willing to share that good news, that hope, with the people who cross your path? Because there is no one beyond the transforming grace and power of God, if they will let Him. Father in heaven, I want the two words, yes, Lord, to be in my vocabulary. I want, Lord, to be willing for you to mold me and fashion me each day into the person you want me to be. But not just me, I pray the same for every single one of us here today. That you would mold our individual hearts. That you would shape our families. And even in a broader sense that you would fashion this church into exactly what you intend for us to be. And we thank you for the power of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Have thine own way, Lord, number 567.
That is our prayer, that you would work in our hearts and shine from our hearts because of your power at work. As we leave this service today, may it be with that blessed hope and courage, please guide our steps through the coming week and bring us back to praise your name. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.